Okay, class, let's move forward with lecture number two. So we're moving right along in the 26 lectures we have for this semester. It'll pass quicker than you think. Honestly, it will. Uh, the last time we were together, we talked about the uh, voyages of uh, Christopher Columbus, or actually, I mentioned one voyage of Christopher Columbus. And I asked you at that time, who discovered America? Well, we don't really know. We know that there were three waves of Asian immigration, and we also had one from Polynesia and one from Northern Europe, too. You got to be familiar with such individuals as Leif Erikson. We also mentioned Adam Marco Polo, kind of an interesting adventure that he uh, underwent, being on the court at Kublai Khan, if you will, for, I think it was 17 years. You mentioned also about the Black Death, Black Death, bubonic plague. You should be familiar with that. It devastated the population in Europe by at least one-third, and combine that with famine, incessant wars, and the European population declined by about 67%, honestly, here. All right, and we also talked about that, uh, Christopher Columbus, his first voyage. We have three other voyages to talk about in just a few minutes here. His first voyage, which took place in uh, 1492. You know that. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And he, in the first voyage, he had to leave 39 of his sailors behind. He constructed a hastily built fort, Fort La Navidad. When Columbus returned on his second voyage the next year, nobody was there. And to this day, we still don't know what happened to those individuals. All right, so let's go back to my documents camera here. We have three other voyages of Christopher Columbus to talk about here, folks. And this next voyage will take place in the following year. Let me get my light adjusted properly for you good folks here. And this voyage took place in 1492. You can see the other voyages there, 1493, 1498, 1502. Columbus would die in 1506, by the way. So his uh, second voyage will take place in 1493. And I'm going to have to move this for a little bit because I'm going to just kind of uh, ad-lib this uh, to you uh, uh, good members of the class here. And for Columbus' second voyage, sailed across the ocean, left out Apollos, if you will, and sailed across the ocean, went back up into where the Bahamas were, and charted many of those islands that are present in the Bahamas and down in the Caribbean, all down through there. If you travel, if you're cruising down in that area, and you're probably not cruising now. In fact, I know you're not cruising now because of the uh, COVID virus. But when cruising begins again, uh, starts again, you can uh, travel down to some of those islands. Islands, St. Lucia, Guadalupe, Martinique, and Columbus charted almost all of those islands and, uh, and named many of them too. And, and Columbus returned on his third voyage and came in this direction here. This time went down to the northern parts of the South American coastline and charted all of this area up through here, up to where Latin America is up there. Uh, on this cruise, Columbus's crew mutinied upon him. They placed him in chains. Very humiliating experience for a person who referred to himself as the Admiral of the Open Sea. And finally returned Christopher Columbus back up here to Palos. All right, and that was his third voyage, and his fourth voyage was essentially the same as the first voyage, just down to the Bahamas and the Caribbean islands here and back there. So Columbus made those four voyages to the New World here. I should refresh your memory on dates right there. And it's kind of interesting because they had, apparently there was a close relationship between Christopher Columbus and that of the Queen Isabel, Isabel if you want to pronounce it that way anyway. And when Queen Isabel died in 1502, excuse me, 1504, Columbus approached the king, King Ferdinand, and said, well, did the queen leave me, leave me any type of inheritance? Because he kind of felt like that perhaps she would. They had a close relationship. And the king, of course, said, uh, absolutely nothing. You will get absolutely zero with this. And he accused Christopher Columbus of having an illicit affair with his wife, Queen Isabella. I, I personally don't think that that took place. And with this, Columbus was so snubbed that he vowed that when he died, he would never be buried on Spanish soil. So when Columbus died, and two years later, in 1506, he was initially buried, and uh, we think anyway, in the area where Haiti, Haiti is located today. Uh, that was known as Saint Domingue at that time, and also he was uh, buried later, exhumed, and buried again in Santo Domingo. That's where the Dominican Republic is today. Supposedly he was buried in, uh, in Cuba, and then his resting place today is in Spain. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said that Christopher Columbus would promised he would never be buried in Spain. Well, he is not buried in Spain. And let me show you a couple of photographs. I'm going to go back to my documents camera here and we'll get into these photographs. And by the way, if you go to Seville, Seville, uh, Spain, you'll see uh, I had 
large statue there, Christopher Columbus. Uh, his statue's up near the top there. And it's a very impressive statue, by the way, to Christopher Columbus. And be sure and take the time to go to the nearby cathedral. And it's called the Seville Cathedral, Sevilla. Uh, cathedral, that's what it looks like right there, and you will find the resting place there of Christopher Columbus. Okay, and that brings us back to the question. He said he would never be buried in Spain. Well, here is a tomb, if you will, the burial site there of Christopher Columbus. Uh, notice here, look at the four individuals on each of the corners right there. Those are statues of individuals, uh, four individuals that are holding the coffin there of Christopher Columbus. So he is not buried in Spain. He is above Spain by about five feet, such as that, you know. And so any, anyway, uh, they were, I'm going to kind of exaggerate and embellish this story a little bit, but not too long ago, you know, maybe maybe 15 years ago, 12 years ago, there were a group of priests, and these priests were in this cathedral, and they were thinking, uh, I wonder if Christopher Columbus is actually inside that coffin. And one said to the other, well, why don't we just open the uh, coffin and see? And so they took the liberty to do so, and I'm not exactly sure how they did that, and opened the coffin, and when they looked inside, do you know what they found? They found one finger, one finger. I can only imagine which finger it is, but that may be just purely my imagination here, my friends. But nonetheless, they conducted DNA testing on the uh, tissue, the remaining tissue of that finger there, and they matched that DNA with that of Christopher Columbus's son, Ferdinand, who is buried in the floor, by the way, of that particular church, and the DNA matched. So that finger is probably that of Christopher Columbus. Makes a good story. If you ever get a chance to travel to Spain, please do not turn down that opportunity, and please do so. All right, so let's go back to my documents camera here. And uh, anyway, so that's where Christopher Columbus lies in rest today. Now, let's go through an array here of some of these Spanish explorers who are closely related to Spain anyway. And one of the individuals in particular was that of Ponce de Leon, Juan Ponce de Leon. And I put the S out here to the side to indicate to you that he is Spanish. But uh, Ponce de Leon, we've all heard the story that Ponce de Leon went in search for the Fountain of Youth. And my friends, that is just a bogus story there. That, uh, that was uh, fabricated probably 150 years or so after the death of Ponce de Leon. If you were in the classroom now, I would have this uh, Fountain of Lies, this article which would be on the easel there, uh, telling you about Ponce de Leon exploring around the areas of Florida, maybe Georgia, which is not completely sure where that is. And uh, uh, Ponce de Leon, by the way, was the governor of Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico, rich port, if you will, and I found a place to visit, by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Puerto Rico. In fact, go there more than once. Be careful at night, but you know, uh, uh, it, it's a fun place. Uh, bilingual country, if you will, it's actually a, a, a part of the United States. Not, It's not a state, but it's a, a U.S. territory. Uh, but anyway, you can see the old house there, uh, the Ponce de Leon family. It is called Casablanca, White House, White House there. But Ponce de Leon was the governor there to... Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and if you go to the old city of El San Juan, and that's the old city of San Juan, you can go to the new city too, which is much more modern, but if you go to the old city, be sure and take the time to go by the cathedral there, and you'll find a resting place there, uh, Fons de Leon. Don't be surprised if you have the church officials there with their hands out, asking for a little contribution to the church, and dig deep, my friends, go into your pockets, pull out a couple of bucks, and drop it into their collection plate there, and help that church out. They will be deeply appreciative of that, and right across from where that cathedral is, you'll see a statue there, uh, Ponce de Leon, uh, and that's kind of impressive too. I like Puerto Rico, a uh, very fun place to visit. And let's see who else we have, some of the other Spanish explorers here. Uh, I want you to know all of these individuals. Same here at Ponce de Leon, different location, was an individual by the name of uh, Balboa, uh, Vasco de Balboa, and he led an expedition to cross the uh, what is referred to today as the Isthmus of Panama. Did I write that out for you? And I did not write that. And so he was the first to actually cross the Isthmus of Panama. And it was roughly in the same area where the Panama Canal is today. It's about 39 miles across there. Let's see if I can move this over a little bit. And it was in this area, which is, uh, I, I can't see where I'm working from, in this area right here where my 
pencil tip is right there in that narrow isthmus there. If you go to Panama today, it's a uh, it's a beautiful country. I'd love to live there, uh, quite frankly, and a uh, very clean country for the most part. But it also has a lot of poverty. Just uh, don't be surprised with that. And if you go to Panama today, the uh, type of money that they use is called a balboa. And uh, here's a coin. I don't think the lighting will be very good with this. I'm trying to get it adjusted here. Uh, if you were in class, I pass this coin around, which is called a Balboa. And you can see the likeness there of Balboa. He's wearing a Spanish uh, conquistador helmet. And but like I said, you can't see that very well. But that's Balboa, very popular individual. If you're going through the uh, Panama City, and I'm talking about the real Panama City, not the one that's down in Florida, you know, uh, you'll see this uh, huge statue there of Balboa. Unfortunately for Balboa, he was accused of treason, and he was executed. And there was trumped up or bogus charges against him, by the way. So, you need to recognize this, Balboa. And by the way, if you're in Panama, U.S. dollars, that's, that's the currency that is used. I said the Balboa is used, but uh, it will be used very, very rarely. The Balboa is the official currency of Panama, but you'll find U.S. dollars is the currency that's passed around. Another individual is that of Ferdinand Magellan. Now, I'm going to change the pronunciation. Here. Whoa, there goes my book here, folks. I cannot use that anymore for the time being. But uh, let me go back here so you can see where Ferdinand Magellan, how to spell his name. Now, Ferdinand Magellan, by the way, is uh, Portuguese, but he is sailing under Spanish flag. He's Portuguese, sailing under Spanish flag. And anyway, he's going to lead this expedition. It's going to go out of uh, Spain and will cross the ocean. I'm trying to get things adjusted here, so bear with me for just a second here. And trying to relocate my page. And But anyway, we'll sail across the ocean. We'll have with him 265 sailors. We'll have five ships. And let me try to get myself back on track here. Good friends here, and we'll try not to have another catastrophe like I had that second time second ago. But anyway, where his expedition will go from is out of Spain here and will go down the uh, South American coastline and we'll actually chart all of this. We'll enter all these little coves, harbors there, Rio de Janeiro going on down here. You can't read this very well here. But a place which is called Montevideo, Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires. Uh, and like I said, he had 265 sailors with him and five ships went down through this area here down to the very very southern part of south america itself and crossed through what bears his name today the strait of magellan and by the way notice all the fires that were present up here in the uh, in the hills which were above the strait and so he named that area he called it the tierra del fuego the land of fire the land of fire i mentioned that to you the last time that we were together there all right now where uh, Magellan, and actually his name should be pronounced Magellan, and most Americans do not pronounce it that way. We call it Ferdinand Magellan, but it's actually Ferdinand Magellan. And when he passed through, he entered into the Pacific Ocean here, noted that it was so calm, and he named the Pacific Ocean, you know, for that, uh, the Pacific being calm, such as that. Balboa had previously named this area, he called it the, Stur the Mur de Sur, the uh, uh, Sea of the South. And so the name was now changed here, and for Magellan, will now go across the Pacific Ocean. Now, when you travel down here to the southern tip, and this is not where Magellan actually went through, he went through the strait. If you go through the southern tip here of South America, you'll find where Cape Horn is located today. That's what Cape Horn looks like. Uh, I'm telling you, it's like being in one of the levels of Dante's Inferno. It's like being in hell, other than it's extremely, extremely cold, and the winds buffet you at about 60 miles per hour. All you hear, and pardon the theatrics here, folks, but all you hear is just it sounds like a tornado or a hurricane passing over you. I apologize for that. I'll try not to do that again. And for Magellan, he will now cross the ocean here, the Pacific Ocean. Let's go to the other side here and pick up his voyage. Here's Magellan here with his 265 sailors and his five ships, and they will stop here in the Philippines in this area. Now, most of these Spanish individuals were were very religious individuals, and so they were trying. They were Catholics, and they were trying to force Catholicism upon these uh, uh, these natives of these various countries here. And often this would be met with resistance, and that is exactly what happened here with Magellan and many of his crew members as they went ashore here in the Philippines. You can read the article here. Um, uh, Ferdinand Magellan's overconfidence in technology prevented him from circumnavigating the 
world, and the natives that were there in the Philippines actually turned upon Magellan to kill Magellan, killed many of his men, and uh, I, I guess they probably destroyed some of the ships. But uh, some of the men were able to return to the ships and uh, board the ships, and some were not, of course, here. And they finally were able to uh, reroute themselves. I've lost my pen here, folks, and make their way here across the Indian Ocean here around the Cape of Good Hope and made their way all the way back here to uh, to Spain. All right, so anyway, and that's kind of interesting with that. Uh, I want to share with you a photograph here, and this shows you, let me get the lighting right here, showing you Magellan. Uh, this was uh, this photograph was taken, and uh, let me get the name right, Punta Arenas, Chile. Punta Arenas, Chile is down, you know, very, very close to the southern tip of South America, by the way. But uh, like I said, McGillian is a very, very popular individual here. Okay, so let's go back to my camera here, and I'm afraid to release my book because it's going to fall into the floor if I do so. So we'll try to, uh, uh, I better just try to keep this up here, folks. So a couple other explorers, and I identified this with F. Now, F indicates French. You probably figured that out already. And one of these explorers, I will not hold you responsible for him. His name is Giovanni da Verzano. Verzano. For those of you that have traveled in the New York area, you probably have traveled across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. All right, anyway, it's part of the uh, New York Marathon, by the way. And made this exploration up into that area in 1524. Not going to hold you responsible for that. Another individual French explorer. Uh, here's the way his name is pronounced Jacques Carte. Jacques Carte, C A R T I E R, 1534-1535. And sailed up into the area here of. Uh, uh, where the St. Lawrence River is today and laid claim to that for France. All right, the other individual down at the bottom here, and that's not his proper name, uh, it was an English exploration sailing under English flag, but the individual that did this, we give him the name John Cabot, John Cabot, 1492 to 1498, and made an attempt to locate a northwest passage up in this area here, and was unsuccessful in doing so. It will be 100 years before England attempts another successful uh, voyage here. But he, he was not successful in finding Northwest Passage. You know, nobody was, uh, quite frankly. And anyway, his proper name is... Uh, uh, Giovanni Cabato, uh, but we, that's a, an Italian name, and we changed the name, we corrupted it to that of John Cabot. All right, so anyway, those are some of the uh, explorers here, and it looks like I'm going to have to continue to hold my book, because I have a couple other things I need to talk to you about here. All right, so let's uh, move on with Native Americans. I'm talking about Indians. I don't like to use the name Indians, but uh, we'll just give it to the uh, title here, Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, and some of the larger groups that we have, you had the Incas, and we had the Mayans, and we had the Aztecs, and let's spend a few seconds talking about those groups there, and I'm going to move my page here so I can show you where all of those groups are, and where the Incas were located, it was a large, large empire uh, down in South America where Ecuador and largely where Peru is located today. Peru would be the way that you would pronounce that. And then we had the uh, the Mayans. The Mayans are located up here where the Yucatan Peninsula is, right right here. And then we had the Aztecs, which were where, uh, mostly where Mexico City is located today. But let's go back to some of these groups here. And I wanted to mention to you about the, uh, the Incas. The Incas are uh, high in the Andes. And when I say high in the Andes, I'm not exaggerating that. It is extremely, extremely high in the Andes, and uh, in, in fact, you, you'll find yourself light, lightheaded if you go to some of the higher peaks there in the Andes. Uh, in the, uh, the Incas had a population of about 6 million, 12 million, I don't know exactly how many it was there. A sophisticated society, uh, they did not have a written language, but they did have a des decimal type system, kind of like using an abacus, uh, a paved road, some of those roads are still there today if you're traveling down in Peru, Bolivia. Uh, you can actually walk upon those paved roads, you know, that date back, you know, to uh, in the 1500s, anyway. Uh, but anyway, the, the leader of the Incas was that of, uh, it was called the Inca or the Atahualpa. The Atahualpa. It was a sophisticated population there. Uh, if you travel there today, you can go by such places here as Machu Picchu. So you probably have heard of Machu Picchu. It's a very beautiful place here. That's what it looks like right there. The Spanish did not ex uh, destroy. Machu Picchu, uh, the words down below that says the city of the Incas uh, of Machu Picchu, 
by the way, but the Spanish did not find this settlement, so it was not destroyed. Now, it was covered over in jungle and vegetation, but it was cleared not too very long ago, uh, quite frankly, here. Uh, here's a couple of other photographs here showing you Machu Picchu. Uh, some of you may have heard of Cusco. Cusco was the capital of the Incas. You can go there if you wish to do so. Uh, I forget what it is. I think it's about 13,000 feet in elevation. This is not Cusco. This is Machu Picchu again. Uh, you'll have to buy a ticket there, and it is very, very high up in the Andes. I'd say it's about 9,000 feet. We also had another group, which were called the Mayans. Uh, the Mayans, which were in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico today, Guatemala. Guatemala, fun place to visit if you go there. Before I leave this, I wanted to show you, I'm going to go back to the Incas for just a second here. And you can see typical Inca dress there uh, from that lady. And also you see the llamas. And these llamas and alpacas, uh, they're, they're plentiful. You'll find them all over the place. All right, let's see what else we have here. And I mentioned to you about that of the, uh, the Mayans. Mayans are a sophisticated population, maybe a million, don't really know. They had a written language. You won't be able to read anything. I mean, that, that, that language, or the writing has still been preserved to this day. And there are people that can't have deciphered this and they can read it, but you, you will not be able to read anything. What you're looking at here is one of the uh, uh, Mayan temples, which is located at Tikal. I don't see the name Tikal. It's T-I-K-A-L, if you care about that. I see a jaguar temple, by the way. And here's another likeness of it here. You cannot go up that one. Uh, a couple of them where my finger is, let me find where I am right in here, uh, in this area, you can climb that one, but the one where it's just Jaguar Temple there, it is off limits, and you will be arrested, you'll be detained there if you try to go up those steps. I wouldn't go up it anyway, you're going to kill yourself if you try to do so, and that's for your benefit for safety purposes to keep you from going up there. Uh, practice human sacrifices with the Mayans, pretty sophisticated society, I don't know if I mentioned this to you a second ago, had a uh, accurate calendar, well, I don't know if it was too accurate because they had predicted the world was going to end on a couple of occasions and it did not end. And then we have another group here, and a group which is called the Aztecs. The Aztecs. Aztecs were around Mexico City, and a large population, at least one million there, perhaps more than that, uh, led by leaders, uh, the likes of such individuals as Montezuma, Montezuma, all right, you probably heard that name. Okay, if we go to the uh, north, we have some other Native American populations here, and let me see if I this now. now, those populations in South America, Latin America, and up near the Yucatan Peninsula were very, very plentiful, uh, highly populated. But when we go to North America, you find the mound builders. Now, these mound builders, uh, you've probably all been to Moundville, Alabama. If you're down around, uh, oh, shall we say, uh, 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 Louisiana, a little bit north of Louisiana, down at Natchez, you can find some Mayan, excuse me, some uh, mound building ruins there. But the largest settlement that we had in North America, and I want you to remember this, was a settlement which was called Cahokia. Uh, here's what it looks like. And it, it looks a little bit like that today. It's, it's not pretty like you're seeing right there. Uh, if you go to St. Louis and across the Mississippi River over into Illinois, and if you'll travel about five miles, you'll come across Cahokia. Now, Cahokia had a population of about 40,000. So if you match that 40,000 up, and this was the largest North American, Native American uh, populated region here of Cahokia. That's 40,000. And what did we say about that? Of the Incas, 6 to 12 million. You know, the Mayans, a million. You know, the Aztecs, at least a million there. Uh, here's a likeness here of the State Park, and that's what it looks like today at Cahokia. Uh, when I went there a few years ago, it, there was no charge for that. It was just a State Park. And you can actually uh, scamper up. You go up to the top up here if you wish to do so, uh, 100, 200 feet, something in altitude, something like that. Uh, fantastic view, looking over to Gateway Arch in St. Louis, you know. Uh, interesting place to visit, by the way. All right, but it compares to nothing, you know, like that of Machu Picchu, you know, or the, uh, the Maya population. Okay, we also have some cliff dwellers, and these cliff dwellers, such as what you see in uh, North America around Colorado, 
uh, in the Arizona and New Mexico area uh, at the Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde. We translate that, it means green table. And notice at the top up here, this is just flat land, such as that. And then we have where they live is down under here. It's run by the National Park Service today. Always fun to prowl around with that, you know. There'd be a little charge for that unless you have one of the uh, uh, passes that allows you access to all of these national parks and national forests. Uh, national Park. Okay, so anyway, and that's another group here. So let's move right along here, folks. And some of the other fascinating and interesting factors associated with this. We had the conquistadors, the conquistadors. I, and I tell you the truth, I think I can get by without having to hold my book, so I'm going to remove my book, and we'll pick up our subject here with that of the conquistadors. Uh, it actually translates to mean conquerors, so if you see this word, conquistadores, 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 it means conquerors. And the Spanish were very good with this. And I, I want you to be familiar with some of these individuals. In fact, I want you to be familiar with all of these individuals, unless I tell you otherwise with that. And, and one, and probably the, the most ruthless of these conquerors, a person by the name of Hernando Cortez. You'll see it. I have one of the video clips, you know, deals with uh, Cortez. Uh, he referred to as Hernan, Hernan Cortez. He was a governor of Cuba, governor of Cuba. And notice the expedition date here, which is 1518. I'm looking around here for some, some things here on uh, um, Cortez. And by the way, if you get a chance to go to uh, uh, Habana, Cuba, you'll find the old residence there of Cortez. But uh, Cortez, his ambition was to actually conquer the Aztecs. Remember, the Aztecs have a population of about 6 million individuals. And so Hernando Cortez left out of the Cuba region on ships and was transporting an army of about 400 to 600, something like that. 400 to 600, and I, I've already removed my map, so you just have to trust me on this, and and, and embark, or disembarked, if you will, at a place in Mexico today known as Veracruz. And when he got his 400, 600 uh, soldiers off the ship, then he ordered the ships to be burned and uh, destroyed, burned to the waterline. I wonder why Cortez would elect to do that, make that decision there. Nobody's going back. In other words, you're not going to mutiny on him. We're on a mission. We're going to defeat the Aztecs. And we're not going back until that mission is accomplished right there. Now, how in the world can we have 600 Spanish conquerors here uh, defeating a Aztec nation of one million? It is impossible. It just cannot happen. I don't care if you have 50 caliber machine guns or saw weapons or M4s or whatever you have. You're just not going to be able to do that. And so when uh, Cortez and his Spanish explorers actually arrived up at Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, the land of cactus, and that's what capital city of the Aztecs, they were really warmly received. In fact, the Indians, the Aztecs, thought that the Spanish were gods that came in from heaven. you got to remember that the Indians and Native Americans have not seen horses. Horses went extinct during the Ice Age. So when the Spanish explorers came in riding on horseback, as some were founded on horses, the, uh, the Native Americans, the Aztec, they thought it was a new creature that had not been seen before, man and horse combined. They did not realize that the man was riding on the horse, so they thought it was the gods. And they immediately began bringing out gold and just all these ornamental gold pieces here. They were all lavishly decorated with resplendent quetzal feathers and vegetation and pretty flowers. And, of course, the Spanish, when they received these gifts, they just tore the feathers off and tore the flowers off and began constructing fires to melt down the gold into gold ingots. So it didn't take long for the Aztecs to realize exactly what the Spanish were after there. So conflict broke out with that. In fact, Cortes almost, and his army almost lost their lives here at Tenochtitlan in the first encounter. And you can read here the article. I would have this out for you here showing you some of the uh, Aztec weapons that they had and just almost defeated Cortez, but they were able to get themselves away, by the way. And incidentally, uh, the leader, Montezuma, you'll see, read about this in your uh, documentary here, the documentary video. He was killed. I'm not going to tell you how he was killed because that's one of your examination questions that you'll get from the video there. All right, so the Spanish under Cortez were very, very patient, and they waited about six months 
and then they came back. And this time they had with them, they had uh, Indian allies, Native American allies with them. And by that time, a smallpox, smallpox epidemic had been set, set forth in the Aztec population. And it had just seriously depleted their numbers. And for the Spanish, the Spanish were able to conquer, under Cortes, conquer the Aztecs. And it made Cortes hugely, hugely wealthy. A second conquistador, and I want you to recognize this individual. All right, his name is Francisco. You'll have no pronunciation problems with that. Last name, Pizarro. Pizarro. Let's not pronounce it Pizarro. It's Pizarro. Put a little TH pronunciation where the Z is. And 1532, 1538, 1532, 1538. And his ambition here with Pizarro was even more ambitious than that, than that of Cortez to defeat the Incas. Now remember, the Incas have a population of 6 to 12 million, and Pizarro had with him 188 soldiers. How in the world can that happen here? Well, I don't see how it can. Yeah, but anyway, where Pizarro left from was from Lima, Peru. Uh, here's a photograph showing you a cathedral there. Let's see, did I have the name of the cathedral there? It's called Francis, uh, It's called uh, San Francisco Cathedral. And uh, the remains of Pizarro are inside of that cathedral. And you'll also find the remains there of about 20,000 other individuals that are just, uh, their bodies are just uh, uh, smoldering, moldering, if you will, down in the catacombs of that cathedral. If you take a tour of the cathedral, you, you actually go by them. It's really, really gruesome. It's grotesque, as a matter of fact. But anyway, uh, for Pizarro, Pizarro established this city of Lima. And my friends, you have never seen traffic congestion. Well, maybe you have. But you've never seen traffic congestion like you'll see in Lima, Peru. And I take that back because if you go to places like Egypt or Rome or France, you'll see traffic congestion just on the same uh, uh, same level there. All right, here's a likeness here of Pizarro, and like I said, his uh, ambition was to take defeat the uh, the Incas, and he'll do so. And he located this was actually in Ecuador. He located the Incas, and the Atahualpa, the leader of the Incas, uh, made a terrible mistake, and he allowed himself to get too close to where the Spanish were, and the Spanish took him into custody, and they ransomed him. And they told the Incas, you know, you bring us the silver and we'll release your Inca, uh, your Inca leader, the Inca. And it turned out, you know, that the uh, Incas, they took care of their part and they brought in all of this silver here, but not so for the Spanish. The Spanish kept up, uh, kept the Inca, uh, Aldwalpa in custody for about three weeks, taught him how to play checkers, you know, and then uh, finally they strangled him to death. And so the Incas, now leaderless, uh, it, it just, uh, the entire Inca empire just fell apart. Uh, shortly after that, that was in 1538, and a couple of years after that, the uh, Spanish were able to find the Inca silver mines in Potosi. And uh, you can actually go to Potosi, it's in Bolivia today, and they use slave labor, and I'm talking about Inca slave labor, to mine this silver out of these silver mines at Potosi and send that silver back to Spain. It made Spain the wealthiest country in Europe and probably the wealthiest country in the world. All right, let's see who else we have. Another individual, you may be familiar with him, Hernando de Soto. Uh, de Soto is the way we pronounce it here in Alabama. 1539, De Soto led an expedition out of Florida into, uh, uh, we really don't know, into Georgia, probably into Alabama. In fact, I know it was in Alabama. Maybe up into Tennessee, not really clear on that. Uh, the scribe for De Soto kept accurate records, but, you know, it, it, we and we know, we, we know, for example, today from the reading from the uh, the accounts here from DeSoto, you know, they, they marched 10 miles, they camped by a river, they crossed the river, it took two days to get across the river, marched 10 more miles, went between two mountains, but where is that? That could be any place, so we really don't know. So if you're traveling through Alabama and we see the DeSoto Trail here, DeSoto Caverns or something like that, that's just a name that's attached to that. You know, DeSoto may have been within 100 miles of that area, but we really don't know where he where he was. Uh, he fought a battle with the uh, Malvila Indians. I'm going to go back to my camera here. And it was a very, very close encounter here. Uh, Fire and Sword is the name of this article. 
Uh, but anyway, the uh, the Spanish under De Soto uh, were able to defeat Chief Tuscaloosa. Chief Tuscaloosa, you know, at the Battle of Malavila. Uh, very interesting here. A couple of other individuals we have: Francisco Coronado. Let me get this adjusted right here. Francisco Coronado uh, made an attempt to open the Southwest, try to find gold and riches down in the area of where uh, uh, Arizona. Uh, uh, New Mexico, even north of that a little bit, I was able to, I think even as far as, as, as Kansas with that, I was able to visualize the Grand Canyon, but found no gold, found no silver. That was in the year 1540, uh, 1544. All right, so those are the Spanish conquistadors. Now, on the way, the Spanish will establish fortresses, uh, create small towns, if you will. In 1565, they established the area of St. Augustine. I want you to recognize that. That is considered to be the oldest permanent European settlement in North America. It was established in 1565. I do not hold you responsible for dates, but I do want you to know St. Augustine was the first permanent European settlement in North America. It is located in Florida, not very far from where Jacksonville Beach is, not very far from where Daytona. Uh, it's a tourist area today. If you go there, uh, be sure and take in the Castillo de San Marcos, the Castle of St. Mark. That's what it looks like. There is a little fee to go inside. You have to buy a ticket to go inside. I recommend that you just go up to the front gate, and you can look from the front gate and look into the interior of the fort. But if you feel so inclined to do so, you purchase a ticket, and you spend the rest of the day there if you wish to do so. All right, so what is the first permanent European settlement in North America established in 1565? It is St. Augustine. All right, if we go a little bit further to the west, in 1595, uh, an individual by the name of Don Juan de Oñate. Don Juan de Oñate. I don't have a good map here, my friends. I'm not doing well on maps today. So what I want you to do is imagine New Mexico. And for Don Juan de Oñate, he led a military force of about 500 soldiers, Spanish soldiers, and went into this area of the central parts of New Mexico, about where Santa Fe is located today. And they were able to subjugate the Pueblo Indians. Subjugate the Pueblo Indians. If you translate this word Pueblo, that translates to mean village. So these are the original village people. I know you saw thought that was a music group, but it's not. These are Pueblo Indians. And eventually we would have a, a Spanish force of about 2,000 that would subjugate about 30,000 Pueblo Indians here. And so that was, uh, that was a, uh, a an accomplishment by the Spanish, and I don't think it was an accomplishment in a positive way here. All right, so uh, let's spend a few seconds here. What contributions did the uh, Native Americans give to the Spanish or to Europeans? What contributions did the Spanish give to the uh, Native Americans? And I'll go ahead and start with the Spanish. The Spanish introduced uh, sugar cane. They also introduced bananas, and uh, those are not native to uh, Europe, by the way. They're native to other areas, but they were able to bring sugarcane and and uh, and and potato and uh, bananas into uh, uh, North America. In return, the uh, Native Americans supplied the Spanish, or actually the Europeans, with Indian corn, which is maize, uh, peas, beans, pumpkins, squash, tomatoes trillions of types of potatoes, by the way. There are 50, <coughs> excuse me, 50 varieties of potatoes that come from Peru alone. You know, and Europe at this time was starving. So this is going to serve to feed the hungry mouths of many starving Europeans. Now, on the other hand, the Native Americans always came out uh, on, on the bad side of this too. Diseases were introduced, and these diseases were European diseases. A number of these with smallpox, that was the most devastating of the diseases. The Native American population just did not have the immunity to these European diseases, and it would just cause massive deaths here. Uh, just to give you some examples here, um, Hispanola, it's estimated that the Indian population declined from 1 million to 500. 1,500,000 due to the devastation of smallpox and other diseases such as measles. Measles. All right, so European diseases. And for the Europeans, uh, for the Spanish, the Spanish were uh, ruthless to these Native Americans. It was not uncommon. Had beheadings, impalings, burn at the stake here, cut the hands off and leave the hands just hanging by the skin to the individual. Uh, they tried to introduce Catholicism. 
Catholicism, of course, was a European faith here. The Native Americans had their own religion, an unnamed religion here. But the Spanish tried to force Catholicism upon these Native Americans here. And uh, they were very resistant to this, you know. All right, so let's move on here before we close out for the day here, folks. Now, the idea of slavery originated ever since we've had the existence of man. You know, one group of people conquering another group of people. Here. And getting into this uh, slave, as we went recognize it here, was the Portuguese. And the Portuguese began the, the uh, uh, Atlantic slave trade. This would start in the uh, 1500s, if you will. And it was a Portuguese, and then later it would be followed by the Spanish. Later it would be followed by the, by the, uh, the Dutch and the French. And the English here, and the English here. And it is estimated that the uh, slaves that were taken from the uh, uh, West African coastline, if you will, that it was probably 9 to 11 million were transported over into North, I should say, into uh, the, the New World. 65% uh, of these slaves were carried to the Portuguese and Spanish colonies, which were down in the Caribbean or down in South America. We had 35%, 30%, I mean to say, that were transported to the French and uh, uh, English colonies up in the Caribbean itself. And we had 5% of the African slaves that were carried to North America. That is not what your teachers have taught you. All right, so well, let's move on to a couple more topics before we shut down for today here, class. And I want to tell you about England. And, and, and what I'm getting at here is there has to be incentives for people to leave Europe, leave the comfort of Europe, and travel to the New World. You've got to have a reason for doing so. Maybe religion. If you can't worship in the way in which you wish to do so, because somebody's trying to force you to be Catholic and not to be a Protestant here, that might be an incentive for you to want to travel to the New World. Hunger could be another reason there. Just finding a better way of life. Now, for England at this time, England was having a hard time. England had a lot of starvation, there was unemployment that was taking place. England began a movement here, which was called the Enclosure Movement. This was to support their most thriving industry, which was that of wool. Now, if we were in class, I would ask you, where do we get wool? Well, we get wool from sheep. So this means if your number one industry is wool and textiles, you have to have a lot of sheep for that. So England began the enclosure movement. And let me show you what I'm talking about with this. In the enclosure movement, we're going to take valuable farmland and we're going to rock it in. We're going to make these walls around it, such as what you see here, 20 acres or so, and build these walls up to a level of about three and a half feet just to the right elevation where the sheep cannot jump over it. They're still there today, too, by the way. If you travel through the English countryside, the Irish countryside, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about with these walled-in pastures here for sheep raising. That's what they still do to this day. Now, what does this do for growing crops? This means that the enclosure movement, we have to sacrifice farm area for raising sheep. So this meant that this would lead to more unemployment, this would lead to more starvation, and people are disgusted with this, and they're looking for a better way of life. And an individual, who actually was an English chancellor, by the way, and he, by the way, he got crossed up with Henry VIII, and he later went to, have a, to the Tower of London, they cut off his head. But Sir Thomas More wrote a book, which was called Utopia, and it described a better way of life distant from that of England. It was an imaginary island that had been discovered by Amerigo Vespucci in which it was a good, good place to live. And so some of the people, and this was written in Latin, by the way, people that were reading this were thinking, I can have a better place to live than in the United Kingdom in England at that time. And so it kind of one of those incentives here that's going to move people to search out to travel. Now, I want to close by telling you something else here. Now, you understand what capitalism is, and I hope you understand what capitalism is. I think it is a wonderful form of uh, uh, economic form of operation here, where we work, we work for income, and we can spend our own income. But what if it wasn't that way? What if you, as an individual, that you were working for the nation? The nation is the principal benefactor, not you not selfish you as a capitalist, but if you were a mercantilist, then the nation is the principal benefactor. 
So let's go back so you can look at the word here of mercantilism. So imagine this, that if you're an English government, that if you can establish colonies elsewhere in North America or down in the Caribbean, then you can establish sugarcane plantations or banana plantations or coffee plantations, and then you could export those goods to other countries or even back to England itself. The nation is the principal benefactor. If we establish colonies, then the nation benefits from that. It is an economic principle which is known as mercantilism. Quite frankly, I am not a mercantilist. I am a capitalist. Alrighty, folks, that's enough for today. We've been at it for close to 45 minutes here, and I don't like to keep you that long to tell you the truth because you've got a bunch of videos to watch here. You also have a quiz to take, and you have some uh, some readings to take place with that. Stay with this. We have an examination about every five weeks. The lecture material starts mounting up quite quickly here, my friends. All right, thank you very much for your attention.